Good evening and welcome to Choosing to Lead. My name is Megan DeRosiers and I'm president and CEO at 100 Miles. And I'm so excited. We have so many people on this webinar tonight from all over North America. So before we turn it over to our speakers, I wanted to tell you a little bit about 100 Miles and Georgia's amazing coast. Georgia's coast is a bit of an anomaly because it remains largely undeveloped and pristine. It is home to some of the most diverse ecosystems on this planet. With only four out of 14 major barrier islands developed, our unique natural resources include extensive dune systems, maritime forests, major riverine systems, and nearly one third of all of the remaining salt marsh in the Eastern United States. Our habitats support high priority animal species that are either rare or are not present in other coastal areas, including but not limited to sea turtles, red knots, wood storks, indigo snakes, and the North Atlantic right whale. At 100 miles, we like to say that our coast is a wonder of the world, worthy of our pride and deserving of our protection. Our organization is a nonprofit with the mission to preserve and protect Georgia's 100 mile coast through advocacy, education, and citizen engagement. Through the years, this conference, Choosing to Lead, has brought people together and inspired them to act in new ways to protect the coast we all love. This conversation tonight is the first of five sessions designed to help us all consider solutions to big challenges. We are so grateful you are choosing to spend your time with us to consider the question, how do we save a species? And we hope you'll decide to tune in for our upcoming sessions as well. Wherever you call home, we hope you come away from your choosing to lead experience with new friends, information, and a fire in your belly, ready to take what you've learned and turn it into action. Before I turn the camera over to our speakers, please know that choosing to lead happens every year because of a huge lift by so many people. Our staff, our board, our speakers, you, our participants, but one group of people who especially deserves our gratitude is our amazing group of sponsors. Please do what you can to thank them and support their businesses and, the non and their nonprofits. And let me take this moment to issue one big thank you from 100 Miles. Okay, thank you for being here and I hope you enjoy tonight's session. How do we save a species? Thank you so much, Megan. I am Alice Kyes and I'm the Vice President of Coastal Conservation at 100 Miles. It's a real pleasure to be with here, be with you tonight. I um, have the interesting job of introducing the question of how do we save a species? And we wanna direct much of our conversation today towards the critically endangered North Atlantic right whale. It's an enormous question. And I hope um, that you have had a chance to review some of the materials that we submitted to you via email and it's on our website because Tonight, we plan to learn about these species of concern. We wanna discuss strategies and philosophies, but mostly we wanna learn from those who have played an important role in efforts to conserve species around the globe. So tonight, we're pleased to be joined by Wendy Paulson and Carl Safina, two giants in the world of conservation. Wendy is a lifelong educator and conservation advocate she serves as trustee and member of numerous conservation boards and advisory groups. She and her husband, Hank, um, are well known along the Georgia coast for their ecological management of Little St. Simons Island and the care that they take in introducing their friends and their family to the wonders of the natural world and the Georgia coast. And Carl Safina is known around the world for his many nonfiction books and articles that explore the human, how humans are changing the living world and what that change means for non-humans and for all of us. Carl is the first of Stony Brook University and is the founding president of the nonprofit Safina Center. His works have received many prizes and medals and awards and he's hosted many hours of informative lectures and chat and that challenge many of us to adjust how we think about life on this planet. It is an honor to have both of you and we really look forward to your interview. So before we turn it over to Wendy and Carl's conversation, we wanna preface uh, the discussion with a little bit of information. And we're gonna take, we're gonna begin now with a journey to uh, the Georgia coast, share my screen. 
the coastal Georgia corner of this living planet. Here we have 415 rare species of birds, animals, and aquatic creatures, and about 200 rare plants. While most of the species are thriving in the humid Georgia climate, many populations of these rare species are not. And such species are considered endangered or threatened, designated through uh, acts such as the Endangered Species Act and the Marine Mammal Protection Act. When a species is recognized as endangered or threatened, it garners a lot of attention. And in several cases, huge strides have been made to help populations begin to recover. But many rare species are struggling to survive and they are declining because of us. Human activities are the number one reason that plants and animals are going extinct at an alarming rate. Which brings us to the North Atlantic right whale. This mighty beast is Georgia's state marine mammal, and it's recognized as such because just off of our coast is the only known calving ground for the species in the world. But with fewer than 375 individuals left on the planet, and most critically, only about 100 calving females, the animal is on the brink of extinction. North Atlantic right whales are considered urban whales. They, like us, often suffer too much from noise and too much, uh, too much pollution and too few open spaces. The right whale's feeding grounds and their thousand mile migratory route that stretches from Canada to the Georgia Florida line is some of the most heavily trafficked and fished areas in the world. Warming seas are forcing these animals to swim greater distances in search of food, placing them at great risk for entanglement in fishing rope and vessel strikes, the two primary causes of death of these animals. In fact, since 2017, when a few years after the North Atlantic right whale was found uh, far north in the Gulf of St. Lawrence, 46 right whales have been killed or severely injured from human activity. Their migration route along the East Coast lies within shipping lanes of 12 of the largest ports in the United States, um, leading to ship strikes. And the habitats where they feed are choked with fishing gear and rope for lobster and crab. Entanglements in particular can be painful and slow. Fishing gear is found all over New England and Canada where the lobsters live and strong ropes that connect surface buoys to, lobsters and crab, to lobster and crab traps are found on the sea floor is where the marine mammals get entangled just through by feeding and swimming. When they hit a rope, they twist or flap and the rope wraps around their fins or tails or even mouths. And then the rope, along with the 100 or more pound trap or pot, are pulled through the water, weighing down the animal to exhaustion and even drowning. Sometimes the lines wrap around fins and bodies so tightly that they cut right through the muscle and the bone. Even when entanglements are known, it is so difficult for trained teams to dis disentangle the animals. Scientists estimate that about 85% of right whales have actually been entangled at least once and over 50% of right whales have been entangled. The good news though is that this year's calving season has been better than recent years. Right whales have been found along the Georgia and Northeast Florida coast. Um, as of February 1st, 14 right whale calves have been sighted here. But in order to sustain populations, scientists estimate that we must have at least a dozen calves born a year. So even with the relatively decent calving season, we, are, we humans are killing these animals faster than they can reproduce. But thankfully, people on the, there are smart people that are on the case trying to find ways to bring back the population. They're continually monitoring the animals, documenting their changing behaviors, and establishing new rules for fishing and shipping. In fact, NOAA's National Marine Fisheries Service just released some new rules that encourage improvements in gear technology and seasonal changes, all designed so that the lobster industry does not harm marine mammals. But we have to ask the question, is it enough? Scientists estimate that species may be functionally extinct within 20 years. Extinction within our lifetime because of us is a very hard truth is a very hard truth to accept. <clears throat> and I don't know about you, but there's so many complicating factors of what an individual can do that it's very confusing and often overwhelming. 
Furthermore, we have to ask the question of how can humankind begin to reverse the trend that our actions are pushing all of these animals to extinction? And particularly heartbreaking is the story of the North Atlantic right whale. These are deeply challenging questions that all can, again, be overwhelming, especially when we try to tackle them alone. So it is really an honor to have Wendy Paulson and Carl Safina with us tonight to tackle these difficult realities. We hope that they are able to offer their perspectives and to help us discover a path forward for the sake of the speech. So through their interview, um, we would like for you to um, take advantage of the resources that we will be offering in the chat. Uh, we've also offered those resources online uh, through our website. But if you have a question that you would like Carl um, and Wendy to respond to, please post those in the Q&A on your Zoom screen. We've reserved some time at the end so that they can field some of your questions um, and hopefully we'll be able to respond to them in a timely fashion. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Wendy Parlson and Carl Safina. Thank you again so much for your time and for being here. Thank you, Alice, um, uh, for the introductions and, and also particularly for that uh, thumbnail uh, lesson on, on the plight of the North Atlantic. Uh, right whale. And before we get into our discussion, I'd just like to uh, thank you and Catherine and the 100 Miles team for all the resources you pulled together uh, for this conference. If those listening have not uh, availed yourselves of those, they are really worth a look. There are videos, there are lots of Carl's articles, um, other articles from uh, Boston Globe and Gar the Guardian and, and uh, uh, Yale, the Yale Magazine. Um, so it's, it really can give you almost a Berlitz course um, in both uh, the Atlantic right whale, but also in uh, saving species. And I can't think of anybody better than Carl Safina um, to, uh, to lead this, to, to have this discussion with, um, because Carl has been thinking about He's loved species, I guess, all his life. He's been thinking about them and just how to, to keep them um, in, our, in our world, on this planet that we all share. Um, and I thought it'd be good to start just with a little bit of background um, so that Carl, we can understand a little bit of the, the evolution um, of your career because you've, you're a prolific writer. You've written 10 books, you've written countless uh, articles, reviews, you've done TED Talks, um, but you were trained as a scientist. Um, how, describe to us a little bit how you got to being um, a, a very serious writer. Oh, very serious writer. Well, I guess uh, just when I was when I was a teenager and when I was in college, I, I read some books that I found life altering. And it was always in the back of my mind that maybe someday I could do something like that. Maybe someday I could write a book. I, I was always told I was pretty good at writing. If we had a writing assignment, I, I would usually get a pretty good grade on it. And it was something that I enjoyed. Um, and I, I started very small. Um, to say the least, I started writing for a weekly fishing newspaper, not even a magazine, a weekly fishing newspaper of, um, about once a month on conservation issues related to fisheries. And that was very soon after I had graduated with my PhD, which is in ecology. And um, what I noticed right away was that if, if you work on, on science, you can, you can work for years on a project and you can write a paper and, and go through peer review and get it published in a journal and all of that stuff. And everything up to that point, I enjoyed. And then uh, there would be a large silence after that. Uh, maybe a few people would write and ask you for a reprint of the article. In those days, we didn't have the internet. But for the most part, it, you know, it seemed like something I, I enjoyed doing, but it didn't have much of an effect. On the other hand, writing for a, a pretty silly little insignificant newspaper uh, got immediate reactions. And so I was encouraged to go more in that direction. I, I worked um, 
pretty, pretty rapidly, I, I went from a few local issues regarding fish conservation to some um, ocean wide or even international issues. And I conceived of a book that I thought would help those issues. I thought, I thought maybe, you know, if I could do the book well enough, those issues would be changed forever or possibly even solved. And that didn't quite happen. But um, what did happen was people were responding to my book in ways that I didn't uh, anticipate and, and didn't even intend. And I started to realize that a book has its own life, like, like a child that you raise that leaves you. People interact with it in different ways. So I wrote about salmon in the Pacific Northwest in a big chunk of that first book. And one person wrote to me and said, we, we read your book and, and we live in the Northwest and um, we, were, we were very moved by the salmon section and we decided we are never going to buy a Christmas tree ever again. Mm. And I thought, well, where did that come from? You sure you, you got the right guy with the right book? And um, we were having an exchange on email about this. Um, and it turns out that I had written about the, the ancient forests and about the logging. And they realized that a lot of the Christmas trees that they were buying were Douglas firs. They had no idea that they can live to be 2000 years old. And uh, they decided they didn't want to have to do anything to do with, with tree farms or all of that cutting that had happened. So um, the reception to that book uh, very much encouraged me to write more. And also my colleagues on the policy side said to me, you know, we can go to all these meetings and we can meet the congressional staff and uh, it, you don't have to be there. We, we can do these things, and, but your writing helps. Um, it, helps to, it helps to change the issues. It, it gives us things that we can use to educate the people we're talking to. So you should write and we'll go to the meetings. And I thought, well, that's, that's fine with me because I've been to a lot of meetings at that point. Um, so I, I, over a few years, I got to be you know, more and more a person who writes and speaks and, and less and less a person who actually does ecology in the field and publishes in science journals. But that took, uh, that transition took a long time, took about uh, about 10 years, I would say. But it's a powerful transition because what you're doing is you're communicating um, the science, which is, I think, sometimes I, you know, a lot of researchers can do great research but if they can't communicate those ideas, as you say. I think, I think that that's true. And, and I, although, you know, I wouldn't disagree that I, I communicate the science, but I'm not trying to communicate the science. I'm trying to communicate the implications of what is being learned mostly through science. And, uh, you know, the implications are, are stark and, and there's a lot at stake, uh, but scientists usually finish their science and then they go back uh, to where they work and they start a new project. They don't really carry on with the implications of what they have found or put many studies together to talk about what this all adds up to. And, and that's what I see as what I do. And I, I that first book, that Song for the Blue Ocean, um, I, I remember reading that. I still remember salmon forests. That was one of your phrases that stuck with me and beauty strips um, that were kind of disguising right. the deforestation that was going on. And I remember that's when I first met you and I asked you, um, I hope I'm remembering this correctly, um, just what you wanted, what you wanted the reader to feel, and you said, "I wanted you to think about the species as as wildlife, not just as seafood." <laughs> and right. it, that's what that book did for me. So, mm -hmm. what you were, the, the communication you were doing, the implicate about the implications, um, was certainly struck this reader. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I also think it's there's plenty of information. If you want information, you can look it up, but. That's not what motivates people. What motivates people is their values and how they feel about things. So I, I very much am trying to engage people's emotions because I feel, uh, I feel a lot of emotion about the implications of what's going on in the living world. And I, I'd like to sort of follow that line of thinking a bit because um, 
while you have had sort of a, a broader sweep uh, maybe of, of species early on in your career, your, the trend has been to get to, to particular species and go really in depth into the way they're experiencing the world. Um, and I'm just wondering, I'm just thinking, for instance, your, your latest book, uh, Becoming Wild, where mm -hmm. you zero in on, on, on three species, the sperm whale, uh, the uh, scarlet macaw and, and chimpanzee. And you're getting much more in, in inviting us, the, the readers, to, to really experience the world through their, their perceptions. Could you talk about just what led you in that direction? Yes, well, um, I would say that um, the way I try to approach thinking about a book to write is to have an idea and then to think about three examples that support the idea or illustrate the idea. Um, this is ridiculous, but the, the reason I think of it gosh. that way is that I, I once went to a comedy show and, um, and the, the comedian was talking about taking those, uh, those timed tests in school where uh, you know, you're not allowed to open the booklet until the teacher says so. And then at the end, it's pencils down, you're out of time. And he, he was saying that, you know, he, he would sit there and he'd be all calm and cool and think that he was well prepared. And then they would say, OK, begin. And he would open the booklet. And the first question was, explain the universe and give three examples. And I got a huge laugh out of that. But then I thought, that's a really good way to approach a writing project. Uh, ha have an idea, uh, maybe a really big idea, and then, and then, and then, give, and then give three examples that uh, many of my books have three parts. So that's where that came from. I think, you know, if, if you talk a lot in generalities, it's kind of vague, but I'm trying to bring the reader there with me. I have these incredible privileges of, of being in these places with these not only astonishing animals in some of the best remaining places, but often with the people who have worked for decades and are, are literally the best person in the world to explain what they've learned in 30 or 40 years of watching these creatures and have like, for instance, an elephant researcher say to me without, without meaning it ironically at all saying, after about 20 years, I started to understand what the family was keying into and in the signals that the matriarch was giving them about what she wanted to do next. Now, I'm not gonna be able to sit there for 20 years, but if you're, in a, if you're in a vehicle with Cynthia Moss, who's been watching them for 40 years, you learn a lot, let me tell you. Yeah. And, uh, and I view my role as, as putting you there. If you're gonna take the time and effort to spend that time with me and my words, I, I want to make it really worthwhile. Well, the, the big question for tonight the big question is how to save a species. And you, you spend a lot of time with people that are thinking about that question. And it might be useful, I think, to, 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 to consider first why save a species. There are, um, there's a certain um, body of thought circulating that maybe species uh, protection isn't that important. So what do you have to say? You've written a lot about it. I'd like you to hear you talk a bit about why save a species. Yeah, okay. Um, well, let me, there's different ways to approach this. L let me say that our species, Homo sapiens, has existed for about 350,000 years. We, we've existed in a, a modern sort of cultural form that started to leave a lot more artifacts sort of suddenly about 200,000 years ago. We've been agriculturalists for maybe 5,000 years. So we've been around a very long time. We, we haven't even lived in settled groups growing stuff until the last few minutes, the last 5,000 years. And the Industrial Revolution happened only about 200 years ago. Um, and the way that we think of the modern world really happened 
within my mother's lifetime, we can say, my mother is 95 years old. The idea that we can come along and for the few moments that we live, we can deprive other life forms who have been on the world stage for millions of years and all of the human generations to come of literally of their existence is simply wrong. Um, and you don't have to take my word for it. There, there is no line of philosophy or any wisdom tradition or any religion that says that our role on earth is to wreck it. So it, it, it is morally reprehensible to me to say that, uh, or to even think that you have a valid opinion that wiping out a lineage that has been on this planet for tens of millions of years, which is, which is what almost every living species has been around for about that time, or for millions of years anyway, um, is somehow a matter of your opinion. I, I, I just, I mean, to me, that's not, it's not a valid view. It's not even a starting point for discussion. I, I find it to be um, unspeakably crass, I guess I could say. Yeah, and I, I think what I appreciate, one of the things I most appreciate about your writing is that you don't hesitate to plunge in to a moral construct in, in discussing species, um, that it is, it's about values, it's about ethics, it's about morals, instead of a, a utilitarian kind of view as to what species mean to the human race. Right, well, I think a utilitarian view is, um, well, first of all, all of these all of these arguments are moral arguments. Yeah. They all depend on your values. There, there's nothing scientific about saying that it's okay to let a species go, or 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 whether we need it, or um, or even that we that we may need it. I I can't really think of one particular species that is necessary for the survival of humans. But I don't think that that's um, remotely what the right question is. Um, and and all, all species or most species will lose if, if you think that that's the question. And, um, and we will begin to suffer also a tremendous amount of ecosystem disruption eventually. But you will have to lose an awful, awful lot before it really matters to us. I mean, the, the fact is, um, I, it would be a complete catastrophe for elephants to go extinct. But humans don't need elephants to survive. And that experiment is done. There were, there were mastodons, uh, there were woolly mammoths in North America while the um, Egyptians were building pyramids. They went extinct and uh, it doesn't affect the ability of humans to live, but that's, that's not the right question. And if we keep asking them to justify their existence in, in terms of us, they'll lose. I mean, they can't turn the table and ask us to justify our existence. And yet we're the ones destroying the place. Yeah. Um, and the, you know, in, in one of your um, essays, uh, and you were, I think it was, you were uh, countering the, the argument of, um, no, I've forgotten his name now with the professor, um, but that the, but the wild species do depend on us and it's what we're doing to them. And do we have that capacity to, uh, you know, to, to, to help where we have hurt? Um, and right, I, I mean, think, think of all, all of the things we think of as great successes in conservation. Um, you know, the, the recovery of the bald eagle, the, the fact that we have ospreys. When I was a kid, there were no ospreys nesting in the region where I live on Long Island. Now there are hundreds of pairs. That's the way it's supposed to be. Um, we, didn't, we didn't ask, do we need the bald eagle or do we need ospreys or do we need the Kirtland's warbler? The Endangered Species Act doesn't ask whether we need it. I mean, that's at least that's one major piece of legislation that we have that's a shining example to the world that says 
it, we're not going to let species go extinct because they were here when we got here and we don't have the right to just wipe them out and let them go. We, we need to stand in the way of that destruction and, and find other ways around it. Now, you know, civilization didn't exactly come collapsing because we saved the bald eagle and the osprey and the Kirtland's warbler. It's, it's not an us or them kind of thing where, where they're a threat to us in any way, but we are a threat to them. And if we don't care, we will wipe them out. If we really don't care and about wiping them out, we're going to get the kind of ecosystem disruptions that yes, will affect people, will have filthy water, filthy air, the totally disrupted climate systems. Um, but you know, in a way I could say, well, if, if that's what you want everybody, then that's what you're gonna get. Uh, but the other animals don't have a voice in this. And um, you can see by everything that they try to do that like us, they want to stay alive. They try very hard to stay alive and raise their babies. Um, and then they die and a new generation takes over. That's the way life goes. Um, but you and I can have a conversation about it. We can't bring them into a conversation, but it's very obvious that they try very hard to stay alive. That's what life does. No, and you're in, I think I think of your books in so many ways, in, in a certain way of just giving wild species, free living animals, a, a voice. And you use the word care there a couple of times. I know that in one of your pieces um, that I read recently, you talked about extinction as an unnecessary cost of carelessness, of carelessness. Of So to me, often the question right. is, how do we get people to care? <laughs> you know, um, that's well, you know, let me, let me let me just follow up on that a little bit. If if the Endangered Species Act was around in the 1800s, we would still have passenger pigeons and Carolina parakeets and things like that. Um, they they were not um, they they were not an inevitable casualty of um, what you might want to call progress or or just uh, you know time with us. They, they were an inevitable consequence of, of not caring. And um, how do you get people to care? Well, I, I think the way you get people to do anything and everything is how they are educated, what, what the values are that they grow up around. And um, I, think we, I think we have a crisis about that in the world today. I've been reading a lot very recently, because I'm, I'm preparing to write about this, about um, native cultures, wh what you might think of as indigenous tribal um, hunter-gatherer type people uh, in North America, especially, and around the world. And they, uh, I, you know, as a scientist, I would say, I would say, this is arguable, that their view of the world um, as, uh, as spiritually infused, um, where all, all beings come in and out of a material existence um, is, I, I would say, probably factually incorrect. But the, the profound reverence that they felt and the, and the joy that they felt in their constant consideration of um, a, a spiritual stance to everything around them, uh, a, a respectful stance to all of life, and their belief that behind what we see are things that we cannot see, which, um, you know, in a, in a religious sense, the facts of that may be arguable, but in a scientific sense, um, there are loads and loads of things behind what we see that we can't see. Atoms, molecules, uh, forces like gravity, the, the whole history of the universe, all of these things. So the, these indigenous people, even if they got the facts wrong, they got the basics right in terms of how to live in community with reverence and respect in a way that would ensure survival. And if they weren't overwhelmed by colonial people, uh, invaders, basically, genocidal invaders, 
their, their cultures would still be doing very well as they had been doing very well for uh, pretty much since the last ice age when, when people began to come to the Western hemisphere. So, um, you know, what do we have? We, we have, we have built a culture where we're, we're taught that everybody should look out for themselves. Um, it's not a community oriented thing. We, you know, one of the things I read today was that if a person needed help and didn't ask for help, they were considered unkind. Well, that, that's a strange idea to us, isn't it? Because first of all, we're, we're taught, try to not need any help. Um, yeah. You know, you're weak if you need help. They were, they were taught that asking for help strengthens communities. These, these are very basic values. And in our own culture, in the way that we raise children, we have the opportunity to either bring them outside and let them experience the, the living world and guide their thinking to say these things are important and have respect for living things. And, um, and we're all part of this mysterious web of life or not. And unfortunately, I, I think that the vast majority of people are are not instructed about living with a, a profound sense of reverence for living things. And I think that that shows. And it, 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 I would say it's, you know, it's a catastrophe really. I, I love a, a line um, from, and I don't know if I think it's from one of your articles, but that we live in a sacred miracle, we should act accordingly. And I, I'd like to shift that, get, get to whales right now. I know, okay. you know, that, you're not necessarily an expert on right whales, but you sure have written a lot about sperm whales, and you've and you've studied, you've you've um, been in, uh, I'd say, infatuated probably by by sea creatures and the and the ocean for most of your life. Um, That's true. Yeah. <laughs> Is there I've seen right whales in several places actually, and I, I've seen a lot a lot of whales in the uh, in a lot of a lot of different oceans, uh, but I've seen right whales off the east coast several times. Okay, and, and you're well aware of the, of the plight of the North Atlantic right whale, which is yeah. um, I think most endangered um, on the on the planet. What can you? Are there experiences that you've either had with with um, species conservation or ones that you know about that are applicable um, in the situation of the North Atlantic right whale? Well, what I think is applicable is that there have been. There have been many times when an endangered species seemed doomed, like there just wasn't anything that we would be able to do to prevent its total obliteration. And a small handful of people did not accept that and turned things around and, uh, you know, and created an enormous success. And I think that I mentioned earlier, bald eagles and, and ospreys, peregrine falcons is, an, is another one. Um, uh, those those birds were in very very bad shape. There were essentially no peregrine falcons nesting east of the Rockies. Um, uh, ospreys were were it was just like a giant eraser went up the east coast. Bald eagles were considered highly endangered, with only um, a strong population in Florida, and uh, and then north of the U.S. border in Canada and Alaska, but not in the continental US and, and a very small handful of people, I mean like half a dozen people constructed a case against DDT and some of the hard pesticides and, um, and uh, maybe three people led the um, transfer of eggs into some of the remaining osprey pairs whose eggs were breaking and breeding peregrine falcons in captivity. And now we have these birds all over the place uh, you know, there, there are eagles recolonizing Long Island after 60 years of not being here. Um, New York City is uh, the highest nesting density of peregrine falcons known anywhere. That's an amazing fact. Often when I'm in New York City, I, I, I do a lot of walking, looking straight up. It's a little dangerous in traffic, um, but I not infrequently I see a peregrine or two during a day in Manhattan. 
Um, these are things that would have been absolutely inconceivable when I was a teenager because all three of those species look totally doomed. So, um, you know, they say where there's life, there's hope. And I guess that's, I guess that's the, the old way of saying it, but that's definitely true. And, and you're saying that also that um, don't underestimate what even a small number of caring, committed people can do. Often it, it is a small number of caring, committing, committed people who turn the situation completely around. Um, sometimes it's a large number, you know, sometimes it's a big group like uh, NRDC. Sometimes it's, it's a, a small group like 100 miles. Um, it can, it can be, you know, it's not one size fits all. It, it can be a variety of approaches. But while there's anything left, it's very much worth working on it because we have seen some very startling turnarounds that I would not have bet on, but um, I, I learned. Yeah, well, can you describe to us some of maybe one or two of your experiences with, with whales? It may have been sperm whales, it may have been a different species, could have been a North Atlantic bright whale. Um, to me, often, I sometimes think that because many whales and other sea creatures are, are invisible to most people, that <laughs> they're, they're out of sight. Um, and so they're out of thought and, and out of our caring because of that. <laughs> um, but, yeah. So, but describe some of the experiences you've had. Yeah, that's um, a dangerous thing is that is, is what um, my friend, the writer Paul Greenberg has called our tidal retreat from the rest of the living world. Mm -hmm. And that is that the, the farther away that we get from actual personal experiences, the less important they seem, or, or we just never think of them at all. But um, the first whale I ever saw was from the beach at Point Reyes, California. I was not expecting it. It was right outside the surf, very close really. Um, I, I think it was a humpback whale, although usually you see gray whales along the, uh, the west coast there. And um, I, you know, this is a silly thing to say, but the most impressive thing about a whale is it's, it's a very big living thing. And if, if you're at all inclined to have any kind of sense of awe or reverence, or you just like animals, there's a lot to like in a whale. They're, they're an incredibly impressive presence. Not too long after that, I started to um, I started to do some tuna fishing offshore, and frequently there would be whales around because they would be eating the same small fish that the tuna were after. Um, and I often saw them at exceptionally close range. Sometimes they would come up right next to the boat. Um, you know, you hear that blow, that the force of that air. The, the slowness or the, the length of time it takes for this entire creature to glide past you is just very, very impressive. And a really wonderful thing, although we're talking about uh, the endangered right whales, which are very scarce, but humpback whales have recovered um, amazingly. And uh, I used to see humpback whales when I was pretty far offshore, but in the last few years, a fish, not only because there are a lot more humpback whales, but a fish that they like to eat, which is called a menhaden, um, has had the, the first ever catch restrictions put on it um, a, a while ago now, about eight years ago. And they have made a tremendous recovery and they, they exist in um, exponentially larger and larger schools along the coast. Uh, and many of these humpback whales have come in and, and I think started to make uh, a habit of looking for them well within, uh, well within sight of the beach when we're walking the dogs in the morning, we frequently see whales uh, just come exploding out of the water with their gigantic mouths wide open, trying to uh, you know, close down and, and catch hundreds of these fish at a time. And there's a big difference between that going on with these enormous schools of fish and these gigantic animals exploding out of the ocean and being on the beach and looking, looking out and seeing nothing at all. 
and you know you start to realize what the world is supposed to be like i've often wondered how how were there so many native americans with with technology hunting technology that was no more sophisticated or or um um or uh, effective at a distance than a, than a bow and an arrow able to find enough food. Think about what 100 people need to eat in the course of a month. Um, that's a lot of food. How, how are they able to do it? But when you see some of these species that have been recovered or allowed to recover by changes in policy that we have enacted, you, you start to get a little bit of a hint that the world used to be absolutely loaded, loaded with living things. You read some of some of the reports of um, what the skies looked like during the autumn shorebird migrations uh, a, a, across Cape Cod and down Long Island. Uh, it, it, it's something that is mind boggling. I mean, you, you almost wonder if they were exaggerating, but they're reporting numbers that they shot, um, you know, thousands and thousands and thousands. And I, I probably, you know, if, if I see 500 Sanderlings in a year now, I, I would be surprised. So I think getting a sense of some of these successes is to me um, incredibly encouraging and motivating that, yeah, you know, this. This can work when people decide to make it work or a few people insist on making it work. It's worth showing up. It's worth going to these hearings. It's worth writing uh, on comments to propose rules and all this other boring stuff that nobody really likes to do, I don't think. But it, it matters and eventually it makes a difference. And another thing I learned is that if something is really worthwhile, it's, it's going to take about a 10 year commitment before you're going to see the policy really change. So you can, you can be all in and very involved for a year or two and feel burned out and like nobody's listening, this doesn't work. But that's not the, that's not the time frame that it tends to take for things to happen. Um, you know, in a perfect world, people would just say, oh, hey, yeah, we need to change that. But there's always resistance, there's inertia, there's, um, all kinds of you know political things of the day that get in the way, and it takes a long time to to get things that are really important accomplished. But it's it's very very important to hang in there, well, and to join up with other people. There, there, you know, a question was, what can one person do? Well, everybody who's ever done anything has only been one person. What one person can do is find other people who want to do the same thing, and connect with them. Um, Make, make a group, join, join a group. There, there are environmental groups, there are local groups, there are politicians. It's important to vote for people who you think are gonna support the right kinds of policies. It, it, you know, you really have to show up and be involved. That's what one person can do. One person can keep showing up. I love that. And I think, I think it's on your website where you say, what, what can I do? And it's something. You said, <laughs> you can't do everything. Yeah something and I think that aligns with yeah, you keep a did you have a, a Gandhi quote in your office yes I have I have um, I have a thing that's been in my office for about uh, about 35 years it's a Gandhi quote that says what you do may seem insignificant but it is most important that you do it that you do it and I think that is a, a just a such an important point um I would, I would love to get, have you talk about, um, you've written a lot lately about, you've talked just here too, just about the beauty of, of watching some of these creatures. I'd love to have you talk about that, but I'm not sure we have time because we want to get to questions. <laughs> um, but I just want to let everyone know that Carl has, a, has a, he's written a lot about the power of, of beauty and the importance of that as a, as a as a motivation um and but also just as a i think one of my favorite um quotes if i can remind it that the world appears beautiful so that the living may love being alive in it um i, I love that uh and 
you know, I was just going to add to your list because I think you made a great list of what one person can do. And I think another one that occurs to me is, well, for a number of them, reading more, learning about these creatures, even if we don't have a chance to personally experience them, but through books that you've written, through the, which others have written, Archie Carr about turtles and so forth, you, right. you learn about those and um, and they expand your uh, your perception of, of life on earth. Um, but I'm also thinking that they, something that any of us can do is um, introduce others to those, whether there's you know, children or friends or you, to, um, to things that, that we love, um, whether it happens to be, um, I don't know, horseshoe crabs or, or um, uh, birds or butterflies. Um, I think that's an, something that's often overlooked in what people can do, but that makes a huge difference. I'm guessing you had people that introduced you as a child um, uh, you know, or as a young adult. Um, and it's, I think it has untold, untold consequences. Oh yes, absolutely. Yeah. My, my father introduced me to fishing and he raised canaries in our apartment. So I was always around little birds at very close range, you know, watching a tiny canary egg is a very small thing, watching it hatch. Uh, seeing what a newly hatched canary looks like, watching its parent feed it. All of those things were facilitated because that was my father's hobby. Um, he facilitated my demand that I must have homing pigeons when I was seven years old. So um, together we fixed up a shed in the backyard and I started to raise homing pigeons. My parents would take me to the Museum of Natural History or to the zoo or to the public aquarium and those were, uh, for a kid who was living in the city, those were um, really, really important experiences. I think even something, uh, well, I've had a, a couple of times I've had friends say, I, I really want my kids to love animals. So next year we're going to Botswana. And, yeah. and I say to them, do you have a bird feeder? Yeah. Because you know, Botswana is another world. That's not their real life. But going out every morning to feed the birds and seeing who's who's coming and how it changes it, it, over the course of the season, that I think makes a deeper and longer lasting impression. But taking a kid out in the backyard and a, a 12 foot by 12 foot garden and plant something, watch how things grow, be involved in that. These are profound things that the little things are the big things. Yeah, even rolling um, polies in the backyard. I mean, that's just you know, and it's a long way maybe from a roly poly to a to a North Atlantic right whale. But I think um, affecting those kinds of uh, relationships and and then observation skills and so forth just lead right on up to caring for species um, as enormous as, as they 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 absolutely do. Um, when I was seventeen, I I met a guy who banded birds and. Oh my God, that was, uh, you know, that was it, uh, my entree into something like professional work with wild animals. But before that, I just thought, I, I've heard about things going extinct. That seems bad. I hope someday that I can do something about that. Well, I wouldn't have had that thought if I hadn't been, you know, guided to where animals are, where life is. Um, and not, not in very wild ways in amazing places. I'm, I'm talking about living in, in a neighborhood in Brooklyn that was, you know, mostly immigrants living in tenements, not, uh, not the Upper East Side by a long shot and pavement in every direction. And yet with the right kind of guidance, there's, there's plenty there for a small kid. It doesn't take that much, but it does take something um, there's a big difference between something and nothing. Yeah, and it, 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 it takes noticing, it takes being aware, it takes caring, um, and then acting. And with that, I think I, I know that Alice has some questions that um, I think she wants to tee up. Am I right, Alice? Yes. Thank y'all so much. That that truly is is inspirational. And just hearing your conversation 
you know, as a professional conservationist, it really does encourage me to keep keep the fight. And you know, one person can make a difference, but a group of people can make an even bigger difference. So thank y'all for for that inspiration. We have gotten a lot of questions from um, some of our participants and from some folks who have emailed in. So I'd like to start. Um, I'll start with um, Wendy. This is a question for you. Um, you know. It, I think we could listen to Carl talk about his experiences all night and it would continue to inspire us, but this person would like to hear about your experience with species conservation. And if you had any, any species in particular that have been um, where you have seen a recovery because of some actions that, um, that you have participated in or overseen um, in the work that you have done in your lifetime. Well, probably the, the, the one that comes to mind is the first one that was the Eastern Bluebird when in the 60s, the Eastern Bluebird was um, uh, plummeting, <laughs> the numbers were plummeting. And I uh, started reading just about uh, certain kinds of bluebird boxes you could put up and I put them up and lo and behold, we got bluebirds. And um, that's always been actually one of my favorite species, but it has done an enormous rebound. And it was because of people who cared and, um, uh, you know, uh, that cared enough to to create bluebird trails and so forth. And then just an, another that I think of is in China um, with endangered shorebirds and particularly the spoon-billed sandpiper, um, which is a, a kind of a, a avian analog to the North Atlantic right whale. It's extremely um, uh, uh, threatened, right? It's extremely endangered. It's on the brink of extinction as well. Um, but there are a lot of people in China who care a lot about their birds, including the, the, the uh, spoon-billed sandpiper, and especially a lot of school children. And so there are many efforts there um, to, that, that I've been involved in as well. That's great, thank you. So here's another question is, how do we, this came from a, a participant, um, in the Q&A, how do we move from awe and reverence to really difficult, concrete conversations with fishermen who have real concerns about their livelihood? One of the resources that we posted is the, um, is the film Entangled, and it does an excellent job of really demonstrating the tension between the lobster fishermen and the communities that are dependent on that, on that industry. Um, and the, the conservationists that are um, speaking for the whales. So how do you move from into those concrete conversations with fishermen or people on the other side? Carl, go ahead, because you've done a lot of that with long lines and drift nets and so forth. I, I've been in some conversations that were so concrete that they would have liked to put me in some concrete and dump me overboard. But um, I, I always respect the, not just the humanity in most people who fish for a living, but their tremendous skill and knowledge and the unbelievable amount of work it takes. Uh, as a matter of fact, just a few minutes before um, I got on here tonight, I spoke to a commercial fisherman who I had never spoken to before on the telephone. I, I know his wife a little bit and he had just come through a gale to, um, to deliver a, a catch of fish um, in weather. Uh, his wife sent me um, a short video she took with her phone of the boat coming through the inlet. And it looked unbelievably dangerous. And to think that this is what these guys do for work, not just once, you know, but like a lot, um, it's humbling. Um, and you realize that if you have disagreements with them over their methods or, or, the, or the, you know, the incidental results of what they're doing, like tangling whales, not, not in his case, he doesn't fish with those kinds of, uh, that kind of gear, but that um, you, can, you can respect people and try to work out what could be done about a problem. I, I do think that um, when I first got into fisheries policy work, there were no environmentalists involved and um, I was not treated like someone who had a valid point of view because I wasn't doing this for a living. And, and you know, what, not only was it what do you know, but 
more like um, where, how do you come off trying to tell us what we should do? Um, it was important to assert that other creatures and people with other values have a place in these discussions. Um, but for people like us, it's also important to recognize that, that the people who are our opponents are, are human beings who deserve respect for what they know, for what they do, and, and for the fact that they are working very, very hard at making a living. Even though, you know, in the case of this captain that I was talking to, I don't like his fishing method. I, I would rather that that method doesn't exist because it's very wasteful. There's a lot of incidental kill, mostly of, mostly of undersized fish. Um, nonetheless, he's a very nice guy. The reason we were talking was uh, a seabird called a fulmar came, upon, came aboard his boat that looked like it was in very bad shape. And um, we were talking about what to feed it and things like that. He doesn't want this one fulmar to die uh, even though he killed 30,000 pounds of fish on his last trip. So the world is complicated and there are, there are caring people who are working very hard, who are our opponents because what they're doing is having effects that they don't intend. And, and there's, there's a beginning often of some very difficult conversations there, but um, that's another case where it's important to show up. You can't just you can't just say, oh, these people are bad. Um, it's not that simple. That's great. Thank you for, for taking that time up. One of my mentors as a young professional in this field talked about principled advocacy and the importance of civility, even when you are on, you know, maybe on opposite sides of a particular position uh, on an issue. Um, but I think maintaining that civility and respect for other humans is, is very important. So thank you for that. Um, here's another question um, for Carl. Um, Carl, you explained that saving species is influenced by the way we are educated or brought up, but how can we re-educate ourselves and or our community in order to save these species that don't have time to wait for the next generation? And what role or potential do zoos have in saving species? Okay, that's two, that's two related questions. Um, I think, you know, as far as re-educating ourselves, we, we are hope, you know, we're hoping that we will educate our children and they will carry on. But meanwhile, we're the ones who feel this way and we're the ones who know these things. And we are the ones who can explain, I think, with uh, a certain amount of humility, a certain amount of um, assertiveness, and a lot of respect to people, why it's important to have communities that are in the midst of natural beauty, um, clean air, clean water, ab abundant other living things, and, and that there are moral and, uh, and sacred reasons for this to continue. You know, I mean, if people believe that everything was created by God, well, then it, um, maybe it's not up to us to ruin it. Maybe God liked the idea of having all these things here. If, if you don't believe that everything was created by God, well, it's, it's really not up to us to decide uh, that we can pick and choose because there are other people coming who will have very different views and there are other people here who have very different views. So I think it's up to us to both be very respectful and also very assertive about these things that we already know now. As far as zoos, I think that there are good zoos and there are bad zoos. When I was a kid, going to the zoo was very, very important for me. I, luckily, I was able to go to a really great zoo, one that is involved increasingly with much better conservation work around the world. Um, they, uh, I'm talking about the Bronx Zoo in New York. They are the reason that we have bison. There were um, almost no, there were like 23 bison in Yellowstone National Park. There were a couple of dozen at the Bronx Zoo. This was the basis for a breeding population. They're involved in lots and lots of conservation now. Um, but when I was a kid, if you went to the zoo and you looked at the lions and the tigers and the elephants, they were basically in jail. The last time I went to that zoo, 
I watched a tiger sneaking up through the grass, um, hoping to pounce on a duck that was in her pond. The, the, the difference, you know, over the last 50 years in how zoos are built and managed and maintained and what their message is, is really, really enormous. To me, a, a good zoo is a zoo that serves the animal's interests in the zoo and, uh, and the free living animals and their habitats with conservation projects, breeding programs, and things like that. A bad zoo is one that uses animals to serve its interests. So that's, that's my view on that. I think we have time for one more question. Um, and this comes in from Phyllis. This is for Carl and for Wendy. With the benefit of hindsight, can you describe something you wish you'd have done differently in the cause of conservation and why? Oh gosh, maybe I'll go and then I'll let Carl have the last word. <laughs> um, I wish that I jumped onto the boat a lot earlier. I didn't grow up really with that much awareness um, of, of species and uh, it was really, I came into that as, as an adult and actually was through Peregrine's, uh, Carl. <laughs> um, but I think uh, for one thing, I wish I'd known more. I, I work a lot with children now. I teach bird classes and actually kids, even urban kids, city kids, Chicago public schools know a lot more than I did um, at, at their age. Um, and, I, and I attribute a lot of that to, um, to media, uh, even though they haven't had you know, the, the personal experience. Um, so I wish that I'd, that I'd known more, um, that uh, I'd probably, you know, that I'd done more, but I'm glad that I got going when I did. <laughs> And um, so I, I guess I, I don't like to think about what I didn't do or what I might have done differently. I, I really like to be grateful for teachers that I've had. Um, I'm very involved in prairie restoration in the Midwest. Um, I'm very grateful what's been done here on the Georgia coast. Oh my gosh. When they think about the loggerhead sea turtles, uh, the, the oyster catchers, the, uh, the, the gopher tortoises, the indigo snakes, There's a, there are a lot of efforts going on to um, to conserve uh, just uh, just extraordinary species. I, I didn't grow up around people who understood conservation as a profession or as a way of making a living. And so I, I had no guidance into it at all. E even though my father, you know, introduced me to birds and, and to fishing as something that was, you know, uh, something to like, but as far as a profession, he didn't understand that at all. He, he didn't understand it even after I got my PhD. He kept asking, he kept saying to me, my friends ask me what you do and I don't know what to tell them. So what I think um, I wish was different is I wish I hadn't wasted so much energy for so many years thinking that I would be a total failure and that I would never figure out how to make a living being involved with animals that I loved and doing anything to help protect nature, which I loved, because I just didn't see how you do that. And, um, and I didn't know anyone who did that. And it seemed to me completely hopeless. But, um, you know, Thoreau says, uh, if a person advances confidently in the direction of their dreams, they will meet with success that is unexpected. Um, well, I did not advance confidently, and I met with success that was very, very, very unexpected. But I, I wish I hadn't wasted so much time and energy worrying so much about it. Uh, I wish I had just plugged along with, with more faith. Well, I'd say, though, that you've reaped a lot. I mean, it, it, you're a conservation hero to so many people, Carl. So it may have taken what seems a very long time to you, but um, it's it's. In, Inspired, you've inspired an awful lot of others. Thank you. And I, I you know, what, what, I, what I'd like to tell people who are wondering how to start or how to get in is um, just make some, make some initial efforts and the, the next steps will reveal themselves. It's like walking at night with a flashlight. You, you can't see your destination, but every step illuminates the next couple of steps. And that's a good way to proceed. And I think, Alice, in the case of the North Atlantic right whale, there are some steps too, right? That that you might maybe even 
be able to suggest is I, I'm going to go back to the point I made at the very beginning that you have put some incredible materials on your website. And I know that I'm going to uh, give a, a, a submit a public comment um, that I hadn't realized on this on this NOAA legislation and, and that sort of thing. Well, thank you all so much. That was a, an amazing into the, the Q&A. Um, we are so grateful for both of you and your leadership and your lifetime commitment to conservation of this planet and the amazing species on it. Um, I'm really hopeful. I mean, just hearing your conversation and, and being inspired tonight, it's been amazing. So we want to close. Well, it's been a the, pleasure for me. Yeah. For me. Well, again, I wish I had all my books that you could sign, but we can't do that virtually. <laughs> Thank you so much. We do want to take a moment to just do just what Wendy said and to kind of walk us through um, some of the action items that we've mentioned over the past hour or so. Um, there are some tangible and very timely things that we, um, as community members, as people who love the North Atlantic right whale and who love species diversity can do right now. And so we wanna make sure that um, we share those resources with you and we share those steps with you. So the first thing will be um, exactly what we've been doing over the past hour is to learn about these species, understand how they think, how they work, and really build a new perspective for their value in and of themselves. Um, related to the North Atlantic right whale, I highly recommend the book, The Urban Whale. Um, it's edited by, um, edited by uh, Krauss and Roland. And another uh, resource that we mentioned earlier is the Entangled film by David Abel, it was released last year. Uh, we have some resources also on our um, 100 Miles website on the uh, Wildlife Project as well. Another thing that you can do is to comment on the NOAA's National Marine Fisheries Take Reduction Rule. Uh, take re refers to the term that the, the feds use for when you harm or um, kill an endangered species. And so there are some new rules that are designed to really um, reduce the impact that fishing and crabbing are having on our right whales. Uh, the Pew Charitable Trust has some, have released a petition and Oceana is hosting a briefing next week um, on this very subject. So if you want to learn more, we have some resources. Again, those links are available on the 100 Miles website site and we'll be sending those out later but if you wanted to go directly to Oceana or Pew you're welcome to do that as well. And lastly for those of us in the Northeast we want to encourage everyone to buy local not lobster. As we discussed earlier whales are getting entangled in ropes that are used primarily for lobster and crab fishing so every time you and I order our luxury item um, from a thousand miles away, we're supporting these dangerous fishing practices that are causing these majestic creatures to die. And so until we have the confidence in the new technologies and new technologies are in the water and we know that they're working, we really wanna just encourage everyone to eat local and not lobster. Stay tuned for more exciting new campaign over the next couple of weeks. Um, so we want to end the session with an invitation for y'all to join us next Tuesday at the same time, 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, for a visit with National Geographic photojournalist Brian Scary. He will help us to answer the question, how do we tell our story? We've heard amazing, inspirational stories from Wendy and Carl tonight, but Brian will help us to tell our story using sharing examples of four decades of photographing the world's oceans and inspiring us to find new ways to share our love of Georgia's coast and the wildlife with others. Um, so to close, final, as Wendy Paulson said in the video, birds and hope, we all have a responsibility once, we, once our own eyes have been opened to share that with others. So tonight, go out and share what you have learned tonight and let's help save the species of this great planet. Thank y'all so much for joining us and we will see you next week. <laughs>